Well, good morning, Northland. Hey, it's good to be with you. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. Let me welcome all of the Northland extended family really throughout the entire world. But we have micro churches in uh, New York. We have micro churches here in the state of Florida, Ponce Inlet. Uh, We have one in Georgia and just, again, all over the world. Will you just welcome all of our micro churches and extended family? Well, we, uh, are, we're, we're coming to the end. It won't be this weekend. It'll be next weekend of our series, Letters to His Church. Now, we'll be looking at the last church that Jesus wrote to, the church at Laodicea. But next week, I have purposefully missed some principles throughout Revelation 2 and 3 that I want to share with you next week. And then I'm going to share a hypothetical letter. If Jesus wrote one to Northland, I'm going to share that hypothetical letter with you. And it will be very encouraging, okay? So uh, you will not want to miss next weekend. Now, as I was thinking about what Jesus had to say to the church at Laodicea, there's two particular uh, thoughts that really come to my mind. One is an idiom, good for nothing. Everybody say good for nothing. Good for nothing. When you think about that idiom, what do you think about? Maybe you think about a lazy husband. Uh, wives, no, I'm just, don't raise your hand, please. Maybe you think about preoccupied gaming teenagers like you out there doing some yard work. You want to call your kids to help, but they're good for nothing because they're on the PlayStation just playing away. And you're like, good night, they're good for nothing. They're just good for nothing. Like, I need them right now, they're good for nothing. Uh, maybe when you think about good for nothing, you actually think, oh, sorry, yeah. But um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, we go pray for any, any Jaguar fans here? We got a few, got a few who pray for them too. So, uh. <laughs> when you think about when you think about good for nothing, maybe you think about a computer that just you know, just spinning, just spinning. You're like, why, why did I even pay for you? You're just you're just spinning. You're spinning. You're good for nothing. When you think about good for nothing, maybe you think about customer service. <laughs> yeah, make hey, listen. I think customer service in many organizations and companies they're there for our sanctification. Yeah, they will test you whether or not you like Jesus because you really want to give them a piece of your mind, don't you? All right, so when you think about good for nothing, maybe some of those things stick out, but what makes you sick? What makes you nauseous? What makes you want to vomit? Maybe maybe this, dirty diaper? Like now, our our kids are older. It's been a long time since they've been in diapers, but I I will say there were a couple that, yeah, they, they, they were doozies. You know, babe, I need help. I need help. Yes, yes. Now, maybe when you think about something that makes you nauseous or vomit, maybe you think about something that's moldy, like food. Like this has definitely happened to me that we, we actually love Hawaiian rolls in our house, but sometimes we buy too many that, that we cannot eat quick enough. And so I will go to get a Hawaiian roll at times and yeah, have a couple little spots on them. Like, no, no, thank you. Because I know if I eat it, then uh, I probably will not be well in a couple of hours. And then maybe when you think about something that makes you nauseous and want to vomit, maybe when a coworker takes your glory, you're like, man, like that was my idea. Why you, why'd you pass it as your idea? And you got the promotion and you're sick to your stomach because they took your glory. Well, that's what we will look at today is how the church at Laodicea was good for nothing in the eyes of Jesus and uh, at the same time made Jesus want to vomit. Uh, So let me share with you the main point. I'm going to say it three different ways. And here's the main point. Now, just remember revolutionary. Here's the reason why I'm using revolutionary. Revolution can mean a drastic and far-reaching change in ways of thinking and behaving. Revolution can also mean an overthrow of a power that is and an institution of a new power. You see, when Jesus came into our life, when we profess Jesus as our Savior, as our Lord, as our King, now that we have become followers of Jesus, He wants us to have a drastic and far reaching change in ways of thinking and behaving. And then also, when we profess Jesus as Lord and King and God, now He's the one who is in authority over our life. 
And so when he's writing these letters to these churches all throughout present day Turkey, what he's reminding them of is that they are revolutionaries. They are gospel revolutionaries. They ought to be living a gospel revolutionary life. And as a result, to recover that life, even in the midst of a culture that wants to be an obstacle and a an hindrance to that life. So here's what he's saying to the church at Laodicea. Revolutionary living consists of deeds that match one's declaration. Listen, if you're going to declare me as Lord, if you're going to declare me as King, you better have deeds that match your declaration. Revolutionary living requires the fruit from your life to match the faith of your life. So if you say that Jesus is the object of your faith, you, you, better, you better be seeing the fruit coming from your life as a reflection and representation of the object of your faith, namely Jesus. Another way of saying it is revolutionaries live in light of the king, giving him the credit for every good thing. So with that, will you stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word? Revelation chapter three. Here's what Jesus writes to the church at Laodicea, to the angel or the pastor of the church in Laodicea, right? These are the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are, everybody say it, lukewarm. This is the lukewarm church, neither hot nor cold. I'm about to spit, vomit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and I don't need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and as a southerner would say it, naked. Uh, you're naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich. And white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness. And as a southerner, I say salve, but I think the correct pronunciation is salve. But hey, you do you, right? But and, and, and salve or salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Here I am, Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. So Father, we... We just pause to say we want to glorify you. We want to give you the weight and the significance you deserve. The honor that is due your name. And Jesus, we pray that every single thing, including this message, our lives and our church would revolve around your lordship, your authority. And Holy Spirit, right now, we're, we're praying that you administer among us because I know that there are probably some people here that are spiritually lukewarm. Uh, they're spiritually actually far from you. And I pray, Spirit, that you will draw them to the beauty, the grace, the power, the mercy of Jesus. I pray that you would give them and give us all eyes to see, ears to hear, a mind to understand, and a heart to receive your word, your truth, that it might change and transform us more into the image of Jesus. For it's in his name we pray these things. And all God's people said, amen. Well, you may be seated. So Jesus, as he is writing these letters to these seven churches, he's revealing some things to each of the churches so that they might recover their revolutionary living. So he's going to reveal three things to the church at Laodicea. Number one, the first revelation is where they are spiritually, where they are spiritually. Just want you to know, I think you know this, but Jesus knows where you are spiritually. He knows where you are spiritually. Like you, you, might, you might play a good game and you might hide it from your spouse. You might hide it from your children. You might even walk in here and hide it from the church. I mean, you, 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 might, you, you might play that good game, but I want you to know that Jesus knows where you are spiritually. And here's where the church at Laodicea was. I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. Now, I just want to pause there and just say, there are only two churches that Jesus had nothing good to say to them. The church at Sardis, the church at Laodicea. Could you imagine you're sitting there on a Sunday and the pastor is reading this church that he has just received from the hand of John and this letter is the words of Jesus to you and he says nothing good. 
He says, I know your deeds. You're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, I'm about to vomit you out of my mouth. How would you feel that Sunday? Not good. Not good. Undoubtedly, Jesus, he missed the memo in the 21st century that you need to at least say one thing positive before you say anything negative. He comes right out of the gate. He does not hold any punches back. Hey, th this is where you are, and it's not good. You are lukewarm. Now, for some people, you may have heard this message. You may have heard a church leader, pastor say, this is about spiritual fervor, that Jesus wishes that you were either on fire for him or that you were just cold and dead. That's not what Jesus is getting at. You really need to know the context of Laodicea and the surrounding area to understand what Jesus is getting at. Now, this past, uh, this past April, as you know, we, uh, there was a group of us at Northland. We went on the footsteps of Paul and we saw six out of the seven churches of Revelation. The only place that we did not go to was Philadelphia. And then also we saw some other cities that the Apostle Paul had visited. Now, uh, let me show you a couple of different cities. The first is Heropolis. It's an absolutely beautiful city. It's kind of like on this plateau overlooking a valley, but on this plateau, there are hot springs. And so this, this is warm water. So people would travel from all over the region to come to Heropolis to vacation uh, so that they can dip into the hot springs and take a renewing bath. And so this was Heropolis. But then, uh, not too far away, there was Colossae. Now, Colossae, they, they have not even excavated Colossae, but this was the surrounding countryside of Colossae. Uh, this is the sign. But you can see in the backdrop are these snow-capped mountains. And, and so in Colossae, they had a river that was fed by these snow-capped mountains. And so when the snow would melt then this cold water would feed into the river. And so there's this cold, refreshing water. And then you had Laodicea. Laodicea is kind of in the middle. Now we visited Laodicea, beautiful ancient ruins. But by the time the water, the water supply, both Heropolis and Colossae got down to Laodicea, it was lukewarm. Now, here's what one ancient writer said about hot water and cold water. He wrote, cold water is useful for drinking and hot water is useful for washing, but lukewarm water is good only to give to the household servants. Like, uh, you know, they're, they're the lowest of the low on the social ladder. They're the only ones that, that really, you know, need lukewarm water, but no one else. Be, we need either cold water for drinking or hot water for a bath, a refreshing. And so here's what Jesus was telling the church at Laodicea in terms of their spiritual condition. You fulfill no purpose other than making me sick. You are good for nothing. <laughs> I know. But I, I want this to sink in. Because they're living, they're moving, they're having their being. I mean, they, they have a house, they have a family, probably most of them going to work in some kind of trade. I mean, they're living life. They're, they're, there's a lot of activity coming from them. It, it does remind me of Americans because many times when we, when we ask each other, how you doing? We typically answer either fine or man, been busy lately, been busy. Well, you know, and we don't define busy, but what we're saying is, man, we got a lot of things going on in our life. We got work, we got home, we got to take care of the house. We got, you know, two, three, four kids. They, they're all doing their thing. I mean, we're just in a busy time. And so there's this, there, there's this kind of storm of activity in our life, just like the Laodicean Christians. But Jesus says, you fulfill no other purpose than making me sick. You are good for nothing. Why? Because they are lukewarm. They're not useful like hot water. They're not useful like cold water. They're stale, tepid temperature. No use. Now, what happened? How did they get here? Well, that's the second revelation. Jesus tells them how they got where they are. He says, you say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and I don't need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and 
naked. Now, once again, let me put up an image for you just so that I can stress this point. So you have the hot water of Heropolis. It's being fed through an aqueduct to Laodicea. You have the cold water of Colossae from the mountains and it's being fed through an aqueduct to the city of Laodicea. By the time the waters, both in Heropolis and Colossae, get to Laodicea, it is lukewarm. Now, I want to give you a three-step process of how you can become a spiritually lukewarm Christian. So this is a three-step process to how you can become spiritually lukewarm. So the first is wander from the source of water from which you originated. So like I said, in Heropolis, hot water would wander from the source and would be further from the source of the hot water. Same thing about Colossae. As that cold, refreshing water wandered away from the source of cold water and made it to Laodicea, they would have left the original spot, the original source from which they were drawn. See, if you want to become spiritually lukewarm, wander from Jesus. Sure, you claim him as Lord. Sure, you claim that he saved you from your sins, but you have distanced yourself Monday through Saturday and maybe even sometimes Sunday. And so you are living a wandering distance from the source of life, who is Jesus Christ. But then be affected. So that's just step one. And, and I will say, some of you, you've wandered from Jesus. You know Jesus. You, you come to church, maybe occasionally, but you have spiritually wandered from him. Then, when you wander and you are further from the source, you are affected by the temperature of the new context. So the temperature of Laodicea would then have an effect on either the hot water of Heropolis or the cold water of Colossae because they're further from the original source. And then the third is change the usage of the water source from which you originated. Because again, Heropolis, the hot water was used for renewal, relaxation, and medicinal baths. Colossae, refreshing, like thirst quenching. That's what that source of water was. But Laodicea, good for nothing. So because they have wandered from the source, they have changed the purpose to which they exist. And what Jesus is telling the church at Laodicea, you have wandered from me. You have let the culture of the Laodiceans affect who you are and therefore it has changed the purpose to which you exist. And... um, Here's the principle that Jesus is telling them. They became useless for Jesus even to the point of making him sick when their temperature adjusted to the context of the larger culture. Now, I think it's really, really important that we understand culture. And I speak on culture quite often because I typically and on occasions and really often I'll go back to Genesis chapter 1. And see, in Genesis chapter one, we read where God created humanity, human beings in his image. And he put them in the garden and he told them to be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it. Now that word subdue, everybody say subdue. All right, so, so subdue. Now subdue is this idea of taking the raw materials that God has created and making something of the world. Let me just give you a couple examples of raw materials. So So as the first human beings, they're they're starting to make sounds with their mouth. And then those sounds can turn into words. And then the words can turn into language. Then the language can turn into sentences. And those sentences can turn into communication. And then that communication can turn into oral view and values and beliefs. That is a form of taking the raw material of sound and bringing order to it and producing culture. Uh, mud would be another example that you could take mud, uh, dirt, and water, and you can form mud and you can make 
bricks. And from bricks, you can make houses. From, from bricks, you can make buildings. Uh, same thing with wood. Like, so you're taking the raw materials you're cultivating and you are producing cultural artifacts. Now, the thing that God wanted, because we know this from scripture, from Genesis all the way through Revelation, that God has always wanted to bring his kingdom here to earth. He's always wanted to marry heaven and earth. So now he has produced image bearers in his image to glorify him in all spheres of life. And so what he wanted from them was for them to cultivate the raw materials, produce culture, and as you produce culture and you put it within a framework and a system and an order, you would produce a civilization. Now, as long as they would live under the lordship of Jesus, they would produce culture and a civilization that reflected God's significance, reflected God's glory, his nature, his character, his attributes. But we know what happened to Adam and Eve, don't we? They sinned. They, they disobeyed the cosmic king. And as a result, they shattered the image of God on their life which means they would continue to relate to one another, but in a broken manner. They would continue to cultivate the raw materials, but they would produce culture that was for their own glory. They would produce kingdom civilizations for their own glory. And what Jesus is telling the church at Laodicea is because you have distanced yourself from me, the source of life, the source of culture, the source for every good thing. And now you have become more conditioned. You have become more assimilated and acclimated to the larger culture of Laodicea. Here's what you have become. You have become this right here. Christian pagans or Christian atheists. You, you say you know me, but you live like the pagans of Laodicea. You say that you know me, and th this is really more applied here in America. You say you know me. You say that I have saved you, but you live as if I don't exist. Your relationships do not revolve around me. Your work, your vocation, your career doesn't revolve around me. The way you steward your time, your talents, your treasures, the way you steward your resources do not revolve around me. You are Christian atheist and you are making me sick because you have the name you have the declaration, you don't have the deeds. You say you have the object of faith, you just don't have the fruit. So, pastor, uh, how did this manifest itself in, in the church at Laodicea? Well, I'm glad that you asked. Here's what they said. Here's what Jesus said they said. The church, Christians, this is Christians, by the way. This isn't the pagans. But here's the thing, the pagan said this, it just, it just infiltrated into the church. That's why they're lukewarm. Here's what the church at Laodicea, what they were saying. I am rich, I have acquired wealth, I need nothing. Did you see this? Ah, 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 ah. I'm telling you, that is, a, that, is, that is, those are American statements there. I'm rich. And, and by the way, some of you are like, well, I ain't rich. Yeah, you are compared, comparatively. To the world, you're rich. If you drove here in a car, I promise you, you are rich. Well, it's a beater. I don't care. <laughs> There's a lot of people, they don't, even, they don't even know what a beater looks like. So, but this American state is here. But, but, but almost 2,000 years ago, it was said of Laodiceans. It was said of Christians in Laodicea. I'm wealthy. I'm rich. I don't need a thing. And here's what it was revealing. It was revealing this. It was revealing that they were prideful that they thought that they were self-made. Now, again, I have to remind you, these are Christians that are thinking that they are self-made. These are Christians that are thinking that they're self-sufficient. These are Christians that are spiritually blind and theologically oblivious. I mean, let, let that just sink in. These are Christians. Now, how did... How, because this was a way of life. This was, this was the Laodicean culture affecting the culture of the church. The church 
was taking upon themselves the cultural temperature of Laodicea, not the cultural temperature of Jesus. So in what areas of life were those thoughts and those values and behaviors displayed and demonstrated? I'm glad that you asked here. It was three areas of life. First was in money, gold. You have, to, you have to understand this about Laodicea. They were an extremely wealthy city. In fact, they were so wealthy that in AD 61, there was an earthquake that just wreaked havoc on the region. Uh, we learned about how Philadelphia last week, they were susceptible to earthquakes. Well, obviously those earthquakes, if they were big enough, they would affect an entire region. So in AD 61, there are a lot of cities in the region, they were devastated by that earthquake. And here's what they would do, it's very similar to when a natural disaster happens here, earthquake, or not earthquake, <laughs> uh, a hurricane. When a hurricane hits here, we typically wanna call FEMA. FEMA comes in, helps, gives money out, or doesn't, you don't know, but nevertheless, you can call FEMA. Well, you, you did the same thing back in that day, it was just called RIMA. Roman Empire, M-A. I don't know what M-A stands for, but you can tell me after the service. But nevertheless, you could call Rima, the Roman Empire, and the Roman Empire would send gold and send money to help you rebuild the city. Well, Laodicea, it was so wealthy. They did not need the Roman Empire's money. They say, keep the money, we're fine, we're rich, we're rich. We, we got this. But then it also demonstrated itself in clothes. Uh, they had figured out a way to, in some sense, breed black sheep. And so therefore there was this black wool that became a popular hot commodity in the region. I mean, so they, they had the Laodicean form of Gucci and, and Prada uh, from this black wool. So they had this manufacturing that was high-end manufacturing, high-end goods, and so they sold it to the surrounding uh, regions. And so they have manufacturing, they, they have wealth, business, banking, but then they also had a medical center. It was, it was this medical school that people from all over would come and they would go to. And so they were teaching medicine and they were so innovative and creative that they had created this eye salve to, to help eyes that were affected with disease. And so when you look at what's happening at the church in Laodicea, they're taking upon themselves the values, the attitudes, the beliefs of the larger culture that they're self-sufficient, that they are self-made, that they are wealthy, that they are rich. They don't need anything. They don't need the Roman Empire. They don't need Caesar. Look at who we are. But here's where the Christians failed. They failed to realize that they were a turtle on a fence post. Now you're like, what in the world? What is that? What is a turtle on a fence post? Listen, if you're, if you're walking on the Seminole County Trail, and, and, and you come across a fence post and you see a turtle on that fence post, you, you can rest assured that that turtle did not crawl up that fence post and station its little, little shell on there. You can assume, rightly so, that somebody picked up that turtle and placed that turtle on that fence post. And what the Christians in Laodicea failed to realize is that God had picked them up out of the miry clay. God had picked them up out of the sinking sand and God had stationed them on the rock of Christ and they are dependent upon that rock, Jesus, for everything. They failed to realize that. Have you forgotten? And that's what made Jesus sick. Like, here's really the principle. What really made him sick is that they were robbing Jesus of his glory and the credit that he was due. Like, if they were rich, they were only rich because of Jesus' grace in their life. If they were so ingenious and creative with manufacturing, it was only because Jesus gave them that ability. There is no such thing as a self-made human. There is no such thing as self-sufficient human beings because where did you just borrow that breath from? But the church at Laodicea, they failed to act, think, behave differently than the larger culture in Laodicea. Pastor Josh, how does that look today? What are the signs and symptoms of lukewarm Christianity? God, that you asked. Let me share seven with you. Here's a sign of lukewarm Christianity. Focus on evangelism to the neglect of discipleship. 
Now, evangelism is simply inviting people into the good news story of King Jesus, who through his death and resurrection is making all things new. You're inviting them into the newness that Jesus has purchased for them through his death and resurrection. That he wants to forgive them, he wants to show them grace, he wants to show them mercy, he wants to reset, he wants to give them a new heart, new, in some sense, lease on life, that that's what evangelism is. And there are several churches in the, you know, in the U.S., I mean, several, I mean, probably more than several, that do a really good job of evangelizing. But where I do feel like the church, by and large, is weak is on discipleship. We're good about getting people to make a decision, not really good about them understanding the process of discipleship. Well, what's discipleship? It's learning what it means to be human and part of the new human race after the image and likeness of Jesus. So in other words, when you understand that Jesus is bringing you into his good news story, that he's making all things new, And then in our life, he's making all things new. Well, what does it mean to be human? Well, what it means to be human is how we relate, how we create, and how we operate, taken straight from Genesis 1. And so now, discipleship is learning how to bring every single relationship that we have and that we are in under the lordship of Jesus. It's learning how to take our work our vocation and our career and what we do in the world and bringing it under the lordship of Jesus. It's about taking how we operate, the things that we steward and manage in the world, like our time, our talent, our treasures, our resources, and bringing them under the lordship of Jesus. And so we need to learn also, we need to have a focus on discipleship so that we learn how our humanity is is supposed to revolve around the glory and the centrality of King Jesus. A second sign or symptom of lukewarm Christianity is forgetfulness that you are dependent on Christ for everything. That's why I love the song. Jesus, he is the air I breathe. His holy presence living in me. And I'm, I'm desperate for you. Let me, let me, have you forgotten? Because here's the thing, I, I wanna live in remembrance of this every day. I don't, wanna, I don't wanna forget that I'm dependent upon Jesus for everything. The third sign or symptom of lukewarm Christianity is the failure to thank God for every good thing, even trials and tribulations. You know, I was thinking, about just all of the things that I thank him for. And I started to type and I'm like, you know what? I'm just gonna do the ABCs of what I'm thankful for. Here you go. I'm thanking God for air and Amazon. Yeah. Bed and breakfast, cars and clothes, my dad and dreams, education and energy, farmers and food, goodies, and grace, health and hospitals, internet and intelligence, justice and judgment, kids and kin, life and laughter, moms and memories, Nutella and naps. Can I get an amen? (laughs) Naps. Obstacles and opportunities, preachers and pillows. Because after you hear this preacher, you will want to go lay your head on a pillow. I know, I know. Uh, QR codes and quilts and Reese's Pieces and recreation, uh, salvation and sanctification, uh, the trials and tribulations, or you can say even TV and technology, utilities and uploads, uh, victories and villains, work and wisdom, x-rays and Xanax, youthfulness and years, and then zebras and even Z's, sleep. Now, why would you, why would you thank God for, yeah. Now, why would you thank God for trials and tribulations? Well, here's what the Bible teaches. And James writes this, the half-brother of Jesus, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of every kind. Because you know that the trials of every kind God's using to produce perseverance in you. So let me just ask us, church, church, are we thanking God for everything? 
Everything, even trials and tribulation. Here's another sign, symptom of lukewarm Christianity. Furious at God when things don't go your way. You get furious when, when things don't go your way. But because here's what you're really saying. You're saying, God, I'm mad at you because this is what the world does. The world, when things don't go their way, they in some sense want to blame some higher power as if that higher power is a genie in a bottle. But see, when Christians do that, when Christians want to get angry, when Christians want to get furious at God, what they're saying is, we don't trust you. We know better than you. So won't you give up your throne? Let us sit on the throne and you can come down here. Hey, do you know what we deserve? I, I think y'all know this. If you sat under this teaching for any amount of time, you know what we deserve? Death, hell, and judgment. Death, hell, judgment. That's what we deserve. But here's what the good news of Jesus is, is that God does not give us what we deserve. We deserve those three things, but he gives us grace. He gives us mercy. He gives us forgiveness. He wipes away our shame. He wipes away our guilt. He renews us. He sets our feet upon a rock. I mean, come on now. Here's, a, here's another sign symptom. You get frustrated at life even when all is well because there is an emptiness. I know that some of you are sitting right here. You, you, you got a full bank account. You got a full tank of gas. You, you got the house that you want. You got the job that you've always loved, but there's something inside of you. You're empty. And I can tell you what it is. You have wandered from the source of life and you don't know how to take everything that you've been handed and steward it for the glory of King Jesus. And so until you can learn that, you will feel empty when you have everything. But here's what the Bible teaches us, is that even when we have everything, we can be content because we know how to bring that everything under Jesus. And even when we have nothing, we can learn contentment in Jesus because in him, he is everything. So, but, but here again, are you frustrated? Are you frustrated and you have everything, but you feel empty? Might mean that you're spiritually lukewarm. And then the last sign, symptom is this, or there's two more, fusion between Christian living and the larger culture's living. In other words, th there's no difference between you and the non-Christian at work. There's no difference between you and the non-Christian that you live beside. Uh, your beliefs, your values, your behavior is the same. And, but if you, if, if you profess Jesus and, and there's no distinction, you might be spiritually lukewarm. And the last one is this, is falling in love with the things of the world rather than the king who is over above and in the world. This is where I love the hymn. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full, like gaze into his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Amen. See, when you, when you fall, when we fall more in love with Jesus, and the things of the earth grow strangely dim, I'm telling you, you will have usefulness to the king and his kingdom. So what does usefulness look like, Josh? I'm glad that you asked. Uh, uh, it, it, and I'm gonna model what, what Jesus is wanting the church to do here. Listen, I, I came up with an acrostic, but it wasn't me. See, anything good, and I hope you realize this about me, anything good that comes from me, I know it did not originate in my mind. It originated in the mind of Christ and he gave it to me so I could use it and steward it for his glory and your good modeling what he's wanting the church at Laodicea to do. And so here's the acrostic he gave to me. I, I, I didn't put it in AI. I didn't put it in chat GPT. I sat there and the spirit of God within five minutes gave me this. But if, if you want to be useful, here it is. Understand evangelism and discipleship that we ought to be giving witness to the inbreaking kingdom of God, inviting people into that kingdom, uh, and reflecting his kingdom in our behaviors, discipleship. We need to see that we're dependent on Christ for everything. We need to exhibit a life distinct from the larger culture. We need to fall more in love with Jesus. We need to underscore living a life of gratitude and thanksgiving. Not, not, just, not, not just for one week out of the year as Americans. I'm talking about every single day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, and I think, what, 366 on leap year, all right? We need to look to God when things don't go your way and when things are okay. We need to be useful because here's what happens. 
when we are useful, when we are useful, here's what happens. We'll never have to worry about being lukewarm. When we're, and that's what Jesus is getting at with Laodicea. If you're just useful to me and my kingdom as witnesses in those ways, you will never have to worry about being lukewarm, which leads to the last point. Last revelation is this. What they needed to do to change. All right, this is where they are. This is how they got there. This is what they need to do to change. I counsel you, Jesus says, to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich. White clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve or salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Uh, Three quick things that Jesus tells them to do in order to change. If you're spiritually lukewarm, here's how you go back to the source. Here's how you go back to the source. The first thing that you do is that you got to look to Jesus's wholesome counsel. Look to Jesus's wholesome counsel. He says, you need to buy from me gold refined in the fire. You, You need to buy from me clothes, white clothes to cover your shameful nakedness. And you need to buy for me Asaph so that you might see. And what Jesus is reminding them of is that, listen, it's not that you just become spiritual to the degree where you do nothing in life. You just, re, you just realize that your spiritual, your social, and your cultural spheres in which you occupy as a human being all revolve around Jesus. That sure, participate in business, but just make sure that you understand who the real, who the real seller is, and that's Jesus. Sure, go ahead and you know, wear your clothes, but just understand who truly does clothe you, and that's Jesus. Sure, create the medicine, create the salve. But just remember that the ultimate salve that you have so that you can see is the salve from Jesus because he gives you eyes to see just like him. So continue to do life, but make sure you're doing it through the lens of Jesus knowing that in him, you owe everything to him. The the, the second thing he tells them to do Listen to him, listen to his loving rebuke and repent. So again, they had, they had kind of wandered far from, from the source by thinking that they were rich, that you know, they were wealthy, they didn't need a thing. And Jesus was like, no, you need me for everything. And, and then what we see here is that Jesus says, I rebuke those who I love. And I know that this series has been really tough and it's been jarring, it's been sobering, it's been hard hitting, but let me, Like the whole reason why Jesus tells us what there are times we just don't wanna hear is because he loves us. He loves you. Like he's not saying this in a condemning manner to Laodicea, I mean, it's a strong manner, but he's like, the reason why I'm telling you this, the reason why I'm telling you that I'm I'm, I'm not okay with you, the reason why I wanna vomit you because you you are not living a, a life that is pleasing to me, but I love you too much to leave you that way. And so I'm rebuking you. Like you are going the wrong way. That's the whole idea about repent. Repent is a change of mind. He's like, the way you're going, you need to repent. You need to change your mind and you need to come back to the source. So maybe there's some of you today, hey, digest this this hard sermon. Don't get mad. Don't get ticked off. Receive it as a loving rebuke, just the way that you would want a child to receive your loving rebuke to them. And change your mind and move closer and more intimate into the source of life, Jesus. And then he says this, let Jesus back into the home of your heart. So he stands at the door and knocks. Now, a lot of, you know, a lot of pastors and preachers throughout the years, they've in some sense kind of used this as an evangelistic like verse. And you could use it as that, but you have to understand the context. He's talking to a church. He's talking to a church that has wandered from the source, that has allowed their temperature to be adjusted by the larger culture. 
And basically what he is saying is that because you've allowed the, the larger Laodicean culture to affect you, you have pushed me out of the home of your heart. Like I, I'm not, because you have to understand this, the heart is the central control panel of human beings. And so what he's saying is because you've allowed the larger Laodicean culture to affect you, you have pushed me out of the central control panel of your heart. I'm not the center of your heart and your home. But here's the thing, I wanna be, so I'm standing at the door and I'm knocking. Because listen, I don't wanna vomit you. I don't, want, I don't want the Spirit of God to leave you. Because if you don't let me back in, it will be Ichabod, which is the Hebrew word for the glory of God has departed. But Jesus, he's standing at the door and he wants to come in. He wants to dine with us. He wants to fellowship with us. He wants to commune with us. When I was thinking about that, I was thinking about the hymn that my granddaddy loved. I come to the garden. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear the Son of God discloses and he walks with me and he talks with me and he says that I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other this world has ever known like that's where like Jesus wants to fellowship with us and look at what happens to those who become victorious, those who become useful. Here's what he says. To the one who is victorious, to the one who is useful, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. What he's saying? Listen, you let me into the home of your heart. <laughs> There's coming a day when I'm bringing heaven to earth in the form of a new city and I will take my rightful seat on the throne that my father gave me and when I take my throne I'll put you there with me mind blown that if we just let him into our heart and that everything that we do as human beings revolve around the glory, the centrality, the Lordship of Jesus. Jesus is saying, I will share my glory in the new creation with you. Wow. And that's how, that, that, that's how you reverse spiritual lukewarmness. Look to his counsel. Listen to his loving rebuke and let him back in. Marsh, will you lead us? Will you stand with us? This is a good prayer that I want us to pray. And Marsh is gonna lead us in a song, but I want it to be a prayer for us as we, as we close out uh, this morning and, and the message of Laodicea, that we want our deeds to match our declaration. We want the fruit of our lives to, to match the object of our faith. We wanna live in light of the King and give, give glory to Him in every good thing. So Pastor Marsh, will you lead us? Draw me close to you Never let me go I lay it all down again To hear you say that I'm your friend You are my and no one else will do Cause nothing else can take your place To feel the warmth of your embrace Lord, help me find the way to you and the church sang it out loud you're all I want you're all I've ever needed you're all I want help me know you Oh
know that you're near. You're near to the brokenhearted. You are near to the spiritually lukewarm church. At Laodicea, you stood at the door and knocked at me. You were near. You wanted in. You wanted to even be nearer. So I do, I do pray that if there is anybody stiff arming you right now, I pray, Spirit, that you would drop their shield, that you would drop their arm. And they just let you in. They will walk with you and talk with you. I just pray that you would. Uh, Spirit, that you would fill us, you would empower us to live a life that is honoring, that is useful to you, our King, and your kingdom. And all God's people said...